So the first question is, what did you want to accomplish when you first were involved in the self-advocacy movement? I first got involved in the self-advocacy movement in 2009 when I was in the middle of high school. And I'll tell you that the very first thing I wanted was to meet other people who had similar experiences to me and who were wanting to fight for inclusion, for equity, for justice, for opportunity. Uh, I very much found myself involved with a rights movement. I don't right now really associate with the idea of fighting for rights. I, I think that I care a lot more about justice. I don't think those are the same thing. But when I did get involved at first, that's, um, that's how I got myself into the room, was thinking I've only ever met other autistic people in situations where we've been taken here by teachers or our parents because basically there was supposedly something wrong with us and we were there either to get help or to be awkwardly sitting together while our parents or the teachers were sitting in the other room talking about how hard it was to deal with us and we're all sitting there and we know what's going on and we're not you know, gonna be very forthcoming with each other, just sit there awkwardly and not know what to talk about. Mm -hmm. uh, and it took me several years after getting the diagnosis before I found out through reading things online that there were other autistic people who were interested in organizing with each other, in meeting with each other, in doing work together that pushed back against that narrative that said, we're not broken, we don't need to be fixed. And actually, we are experiencing harm. We are being excluded, discriminated against, abused, often in the name of help or treatment, and we want to end that. And that is how I came into contact with other autistic people, um, firstly through the Boston chapter of the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network, and found myself thinking, these are people I want to know. These are a group that I would like to be a part of. And that's really how it got started. What was your passion at the beginning? For my entire life, I have been very committed to achieving justice, what, whatever that might mean. And for me, that's meant addressing issues of violence, either at the individual level or at the systems or society level. And even before I was ever involved in the self-advocacy movement, I cared very deeply about ending intolerance, about ending bullying, about ending war, uh, about ending terrorism, about ending many of these things that I saw as examples of ways that violence happens. And when I got involved with the self-advocacy movement, uh, I very much took my existing uh, drive to address issues of violence and to end it into the self-advocacy work that I started to do. And so I started working on issues of restraint and seclusion. I started working on issues like the Judge Rotenberg Center, which electric shocks people with mm -hmm. disabilities. I started working on issues of police brutality, um, whether it was police wrongfully arresting somebody, someone getting wrongfully convicted, someone being beaten, tasered, or killed by the police for a reason that um, whatever other reasons may have existed was also related to a person's disability. And I started doing that work right as I got involved in 2009. 2009 is when I started work on cases like Zachary Price, who is from Arkansas, an autistic student who was charged with felony assault for pushing a teacher during a meltdown, behavior that would not have been treated as criminal if it were from a non-disabled student. Um, within the next two years, I worked on um, issues related to what was happening to Neely Latson, who was a black autistic student. Zachary Price was a white autistic student. Um, Neely Latson was a black autistic student in Virginia who was beaten and arrested by police when he was racially profiled. Police were called on him because he was waiting outside the library for it to open. Um, issues like Emily, what happened to Emily Holcomb um, and what happened to Christopher Baker who were also autistic students that were either charged criminally and or otherwise treated very badly. Chris Baker was stuffed inside of a bag in Kentucky. Um, and I, in 2009, 2010, I wrote legislation in Massachusetts because at the time I thought, you know, if one of these issues is police violence, maybe police need education. So I wrote a bill in Massachusetts while I was still in high school um, that would require police to get specific training and education about autism and related developmental disabilities 
but that the training had to be provided by at least one actually autistic person, an actual self-advocate, as opposed to someone who is not actually autistic themselves saying, let me tell you about autistic people. And that piece of legislation got filed. It's been filed many years since then. And, you know, I feel like all of the work that I've done throughout my life before I got involved with self-advocacy and since then has coalesced around that singular theme. What are issues of violence happening between individual people and broadly in society? And what can I and we as movements and communities do to stop it? And how would you compare the self-advocacy movement to other movements like LGBTQ, um, the autism movement, and the civil rights movement? I think that comparisons can be useful, but they're also limited. I don't think it's very fair to say, uh, as people often will, oh, the LGBTQ movement is the new civil rights movement. That's not true. People who are queer or trans have been organizing for a very long time. Uh, white people who are LGBTQ have certainly learned from the tactics and the history of the black-led civil rights movement in the United States history. But they're not separate, right? Because there are people of color, black or other people of color, who are also LGBTQ and always have been. Like one of the most famous examples is Bayard Rustin, right? right. And because of that, when people sometimes will ask me, um, what do you see as uh, how these movements are related, how can you compare them, I will say, I think we're asking the wrong question. I don't think the question should be, how can we compare movements, because that question assumes that we're separate, but rather, what can movements that have been led by specific communities learn from each other? Where have we learned from each other successfully? Where have we worked together successfully? Where have we failed? And more, more often than not, the answer to the question of where have we failed is we failed those of us that actually belong to more than one movement. People of color who are also disabled feeling shut out, both of racial justice movements and of disability rights work. And I'm using the word rights very deliberately here. Mm -hmm. And I, I see that all the time. I hear it from my Asian disabled friends who will say, where are the Asians doing disability work? There's only a handful of us. I will hear it from my black friends in the disability community who say, when we talk about disability rights history, who do we learn about? We learn about Ed Roberts, we learn about Justin Dart Jr., we learn about Judy Human, maybe Tony Coelho, and all of these people are from a very specific demographic, which is to say, the white disability community. And that and there have been so many black disabled leaders going back to the beginning of disabled people's movements, but whose names are not spoken or are not taught. Like one example right now of a living legend of someone who's doing work currently is Anita Cameron from Denver, Colorado. And Anita Cameron has been organizing with ADAPT for decades. Anita has been, like, I think, arrested something like 50 plus times at ADAPT actions. Anita is a living uh, testament to black disabled history who has been well connected with groups and organizations throughout her lifetime. And yet, despite the work she's been doing at the national level and in her home state in Colorado, most people that I've talked to have never heard of her. They don't know who she is, but those other names, they know who those people are. Um, so when you ask me, like, how can we compare movements, one of the things that I will say is there's useful comparisons. Useful comparisons when we talk about how are people marginalized. We get erased. We get treated as tokens. We get told there's something wrong with us. We get isolated. We get abused and then blamed when we're the ones that are abused. Those are patterns of how we are marginalized. But the specific ways that they play out often can't be applied across the board. So here's one pet peeve of mine is I've seen these bumper stickers that have like four squares on them. One of them is an icon of the black civil rights movement. One is a rainbow flag. One is a, the image of the person in a wheelchair. And I think one is like a woman's movement image or something. And the, the logo will say, same struggle, different difference. It's a pet peeve of mine because that type of cutesy way of talking about movements erases both the fact that how we are oppressed is not identical and that actually while we may be struggling against certain patterns that may be the same the specific things we are working to repair are different 
like even within one category, right? So the autistic civil rights movement is not identical to the independent living movement that was originally spearheaded by people mostly with physical disabilities. That's not to say that there are not very similar things that happen, discrimination in employment, not being able to live in the community, being denied access to services, being assumed incapable of having sex, of falling in love, being kicked out of school, being sexually abused, being attacked by police. All of those things happen both to able-bodied autistic people and neurotypical physically disabled people. And of course, if you're both, if you're autistic and physically disabled. But there are specific things that are different. An able-bodied autistic person doesn't ever have to worry about physical access by ramps, lifts, and elevators, which are often not to code and not helpful, even in businesses that claim, oh, we're very accessible. They're not. They're not accessible. They are not there at that base. Supposedly base level. And neurotypical people with physical disabilities will often not have to worry about being placed in a guardianship. At least today, in the 21st century, will often not have to worry about being placed in a guardianship and moved into a group home. Because if they're neurotypical, they're more likely to be able to prove to ableist standards, oh, I'm smart, I'm competent, than someone who's not. If you take it from a racial standpoint, right? Like I, as an East Asian, an East Asian American, I don't have the same struggles as Latinx people, as black people, or as indigenous people. As an East Asian American, my history includes the Chinese Exclusion Act. It includes acts of mob violence against Chinese immigrant laborers throughout the West Coast between the end of the 1800s and the beginning of the 1900s, who were thought of as the yellow peril coming into the country to take away jobs from American, read, white workers. Sound very familiar? It should, right? But I don't have a history of my entire peoples being uh, uh, subjected to genocide by colonizers coming from Europe. Indigenous people's history is not mine. I don't have a history of people like me being forcibly enslaved and sold as human property in the United States. That is not my history. That is black people's history, right? And so to say we all have the same struggle is disingenuous. And to ask me to compare movements is a little bit, bit like asking, can we compare apples and oranges? We can't quite do it. We can recognize patterns of how oppression works, and we can recognize where we have failed to acknowledge those of us that occupy more than one identity, more than one experience. But it's not really possible to say, let's have a clean and simple comparison. But thank you for that question. Mm -hmm. And how would you keep people motivated and enthusiastic about the movement during different things that you're working on? I think a lot of it um, has to do with reminding people that when we're talking about issues, right, like Medicaid or police violence or segregation and inclusion in schools or anything it might be, we're talking about real people's human lives. We're talking about human beings, human beings who are subjected to violence, human beings who are being murdered, human beings who are being cut off from their life-saving services, human beings who are locked inside cages. And it's really easy for us to fall into a trap, even those of us that do advocacy and activism, of thinking, unless it directly affects me, I have to learn a lot about it to, to know why I should care and why it's important. And I think that's a really dangerous trap because what it tells us is no matter who we are, who you are, Tia, or who I am, Lydia, is that the only issues that I can be expected to understand right away and to know this is important and we need to be working on it to change the world into the better world, the community that we want to have, if it affects me. If it affects people that are not like me, then maybe I'm not going to be so cruel to say oh, it's not relevant but we are trained to think, well, I don't know why it's important. Someone has to explain to me why it's important. I'm not comfortable taking a position or making a statement or choosing a side because I'm not from that group, so I don't really know anything about it. And you know, the reality is while we sit here, whoever the we is, debating why should this be important, I don't know anything about it, real people are dying. I don't need to know the details. I need to know that human beings their lives are at stake. 
And I think that is what we have to keep reminding ourselves and each other. And what would you like to see in the future? One thing that I definitely want to see in the future of disability movements is embracing a full move toward justice-oriented work, not rights. What I understand is the difference between rights and justice is that when we talk about disability rights, we're saying, how can we change laws and policies to get better inclusion and better opportunities? And when we talk about justice, what we're talking about is, how can we change society and culture so that disabled people are no longer thought of as less than? And for me, that's a huge difference. I don't mean to say that I think we shouldn't work on laws or policies. We absolutely should. Laws and policies can affect people's lives. They can end them. They can prolong them. They can make them possible, right? That's why the threat of slashing Medicaid is so dangerous. It will kill people. That's why not addressing how our criminal legal system is so violent at every level is mandatory for us to do. We have to address it. Because if we don't, people are dying, mostly black and brown disabled people, right? But if we only ever try to deal with rights and laws and policies, we're never getting to the root of the problem, which is the fact that we can change all the laws we want. We've passed a lot of great laws. We passed IDEA, we passed the Rehab Act, we passed the ADA, the ADA Amendments Act, we passed the DD Act and Bill of Rights. Right? Those are great laws. We passed the ABLE Act recently. And Despite all these laws, we're still in sheltered workshops, we're still in institutions, we're still being killed by police, we are still being segregated in school, we are still being sexually abused at terrifying rates, we are still being killed by family members and caregivers, we are still being denied access to a social safety net. All of those things and many more are still happening, even though we've changed the law. Does that mean we need to improve the law? Does that mean that we need to expand the law? Does it mean we need to enforce it better? Yeah, it does. But it also means that no matter how much we change these laws or add new ones, we still have an underlying problem, which is that we understand disabled people as less than. And compounding that and adding to that and causing that is the fact that when you ask me, you know, can we compare movements? I don't, one of the reasons I think we can't really compare movements is because we're all related. When you say, oh, people of color, especially black and brown kids, shouldn't be in the high achieving schools, that's using the language of ableism to say that, to say, oh, people are poor or homeless because they're lazy, stupid, or mentally ill, is to use the language of disability. To say, oh, we don't want these violent brown people, violent Muslims, violent Latinx immigrants coming to this country because they are unable to control themselves and they come from backward civilizations. All of that total BS is coached not just in the language of racism, but also in the language of disability, in the language of ableism, right? So all of our movements are really wrapped up together. They're not identical. They're not interchangeable, but they are interconnected. And to say, let's focus on justice. How can we move away from rights toward justice? Let's us understand that. Let's us address where we haven't done as well so we can do better about lifting up the leadership and the work of those of us in disabled community who are also people of color, who are immigrants, who are LGBTQ, who experience whatever other type of marginality, have been homeless, have been sex workers, have been incarcerated, and in moving toward a society and a culture where all of us are treated as valuable, where none of us are considered less than, where none of us are erased or subjected to violence, and we are able to live in societies that value each of us for who we are, not in spite of what we are, not just because of what we can work or how we can work, but for us as human beings. And that's where I'd like to see our movement go. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me.